có con nít ở đây không? Mình sẽ có con nít ở đây không? Mình bắt đầu hả? How about the little one? Are there little ones here? No, you guys are uh, twins. Are you twins? Do we have the the tweeny twin? Teeny twin? Tiny twin? Ai ai chăm sóc cái đó hả? Ai chăm sóc my em children? Nó cái số up không? Có biết không? À, rất là khỏi cần tới đây. Ok. So, please uh, sit up beautifully. Sit up like a mountain. Okay, your back straight. You make a triangle every time you hear the sound of the bell. You can train to be like a mountain. Okay. Yeah, you sit like a. The base is like a triangle, and then your two knees and your head like triangle, and your arm make the rest of the triangle. So you can drop your arm like that. Free your hands up of anything. You're not holding anything, and you can put your hands on your lap. Or you can put it on your uh, your uh, at the center, okay? And we can close our eyes and come back to our breathing. Close your eyes. When we hear the sound of the bell. We don't let anybody bother us. Any sound, any movement. Breathing in. I enjoy my in breath. Dear respected teacher, dear noble community, dear family, can't believe it's uh, nearing the end of the retreat. We still have a few more hours, right? How many of you uh, don't you want don't want to go home? Yeah. How many of you are waiting to go home? Yes. Come on. Oh, it's too peaceful here. Yes. <laughs> It was so lovely last night, huh? See all the, the, uh, the songs and the skits. How many of you, you, you saw your parents being silly? Yeah? Yeah, I was imagining what the, all the, your children were looking at, your parents doing funny stuff. Yeah, being silly. And I hope they can maintain that silliness when they go home with you. And they can uh, be a child as well, and not to be just your parents. So that's what I was uh, enjoying last night. I seeing the kids, seeing the young ones, of course, go up there and sing and song, but the also, I really loved it when I see the parents like fully, uh, uh, what do you call it, go a uh, little wild. <laughs> Some of them were a little wild last night. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I worry for the kids. <laughs> But it's very good medicine, some of us, to, to get out of our, uh, our uh, 
what is it? Uh, a roll? They, they have hats? Yeah, it's nice to like put your hat down. And uh, for us too, sometimes uh, as children, as young uh, tweens, as yeah, you're growing up, we're, we're the child, but we can also become the parent. I saw some young ones here cleaning the parents' uh, dishes and bowl. I saw uh, a, a, a young a girl, I think maybe younger than a tween, uh, actually took the parents, uh, the mother's uh, dishes. And I think she's just excited to go wash dishes. Maybe she doesn't get to do it at home. But uh, that really nourished me. So that's like the child taking care of the parent. Isn't that wonderful? That you become the parent and you watch out and see if your mom and dad like need help. So sometimes we can play the role. You can surprise them one time and go in their room and fold their beds and pick up their socks and their t-shirt. Yeah, you got to be Zen. You know, we're in the tradition of Zen. So you do stuff that freak people out. Yeah? The parents are going like, what's wrong with my son? I mean, I better take him to a psychotherapist. He's like cleaning my room. He's like... <laughs> and so they play around, okay? So you come to the monastery, we learn to uh, uh, play around with the different roles so we don't get stuck with one role. How many of you ever clean your parents' room? Really? What did, what did you do? How did you clean your parents' room? Uh, did you clean your parents' room? What did you do? Did you put it on the floor and everything? Oh, it annoys you. Yeah, okay. That's great. Don't let it become OCD, okay? That's good. So let's, uh, let's do that, okay? Remember, we, we had five days here of like, um, just like doing different things, right? You get, it was kind of challenging, some of it like being still or being quiet or attending schedule. Uh, but they were all ho hopefully uh, challenge us a little bit and hopefully nourish us too. You know, we met new friends and we found maybe a different way of looking at other people and ourselves. So the monastery is for an experiment like that. It's different from school. You know, school, you... Uh, you learn books, a lot of information, class and stuff. Here, we learn to train to actually uh, create new habits, like washing your own dishes, sitting still, right? Learning to share our emotion, our feelings. How many of you attended the uh, beginning of new? I think most of you, yeah? There's a lot of families here. And so, in the families, they, it's nice to have your family come here because then you get to relate to each other different. When I see a parent reprimand their kid and I tell the parent, okay, breathe, you know, and uh, not to be the parent. And it's very hard for the parent to be a non-parent. And then that's uh, very nice for, uh, for young people to see their parents, uh, you know, do different things. Okay? So it's a monastery here. Not just for you is challenging, but it's also for the parents and for the adults here. They get to, uh, you know, have new habits and new ways of looking and doing things, right? So, yeah, thank you for all the families you bring here. As you can see, I have a, a basket full of stuff. And uh, I wanted to share with you. This is, everyone knows? Yeah, tomato, yeah? You ever wonder... Uh, you know where a tomato comes from? Where is it comes from? A bush, a tree, or what? A vine. That's right. It's a kind of plant, sort of like a vine. It comes up, and the leaves, you ever touch the leaf? It's very, very prickly and sticky, right? Yeah they, yeah, they poke at you, right? And this is what? Yeah? This is the stem, right? It was stuck to the plant right here. What is this? You see this? Uh, it used to be a flower. Can you see it? Right? There's like petals around here. 
Yeah, the petals around here, and it was stuck in here somewhere. And then the, 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 the bugs, the bees and stuff come, and they do whatever they do with the pollen, and the leaves fall off, and then and the inside starts off really small, and then it comes out, right? And then it starts to go like this, and it goes, and it's hanging. Have you seen a fully uh, tomato plant that has a lot of tomato? It's like, ah, uh, you know. It's like praying for you to come and pick it. <laughs> it's like, you know, we have happy farm in Plum Village. I love the summertime. I go down there, and instead of eating lunch sometime, I eat the garden right off, uh, uh, like snow peas. Uh, we had cherry tomatoes. So I just want to bring your attention to this. And every fruit has one of this. So when you look at this, you kind of know it came from a plant, right? Like it's stuck there and then it's removed, right? So the tomato has one. And how about an orange? See? See this part? This is where the flower was and then it all folded in. And it has one too. You see this? It, it used to have even a little... Uh, popping piece that comes out and you have to take off, right? Orange has one. How about avocado? You see that? Avocado has one. Every fruit has one. How about this? Melon. What is this? You ever seen this? Is this a bush, a tree, or what? You ever seen this plant? Yeah, no, it's like a vine. It crawls on the ground, it, it climbs on things, and it produces, uh, what are these called? Some kind of melon? Yeah, this also has a, I don't know what you call it, but take your finger. Do you think you have one of these? Yeah? Okay, now take your finger, and I'm going to show you where yours is. All right, put it under your shirt. Everyone put it under your shirt and come to your belly button. Okay? Right there. Ah. See, you have one. You think you're a human being? No, you are a fruit. <laughs> and you have legs and arms, but, I mean, you're not fruity, but, <laughs> but you're a fruit. Right? See? What is this? Ma mango. It also has one. So when you see this, you remember, what, what, where, what was the parent of the mango look like? Anybody know? Is it a bush, a tree, or a, a vine? A tree. Yeah, can you see the tree? Have you ever seen a mango tree? Yeah, they all ripe very similar time, and it's like a lot of mangoes. It's amazing. This one is, is like on steroids. Huge. How about this one? This is a Fuji apple, and it has one. You see this? This one is very clear that it was once a flower because it has still some of the, uh, you know, these uh, petal stuff, right? You see that? So when you eat a fruit, remember the tree. This is all came for a tree. We're going to have a more cold climate. So this has... Uh, a tree. How about lemon? It came from a bush or a tree? Yeah. You see the tree? Pick it from the tree. How about ah, this one? This is a trippy one. It's a little different from a fruit. Yeah. See this? So this is both a fruit and a parent. See, it has roots, and you can produce uh, stuff with this still. So these are what you call it ground, ground buds. They would be called buds, right? So this is a very interesting uh, fruit. How about this guy? I try to find a smaller one. Does this come from a tree? Yeah, it's on the ground. And check out his or her, their belly button. 
Isn't that huge? Look at this one. That's like a, like a birth, what do they call it, birth scar? What do they call it? Like, kind of like huge, huh? So these are the, so next time you eat a fruit, think of the, the tree, the bush, the plant that it came from. And, you know, this is one thing I learned from my teacher, that we also uh, can think of our parents. And sometimes we think we're like, you know, like separate from our parents. You know, I saw in this retreat a very beautiful, uh, you know, the child, the baby needed food. And the father wanted to uh, stay in the hall and listen to Dhamma talk. But the father, you know, was talking to the child and the, the child wanted to eat. And I think, you know, at a certain age when they were children, they eat constantly. And there was like a little bit of like, oh, the father was like conflicted. He really wanted to be in the Dharma talk. But then, you know, he goes and go gets and finds food. And he found actually some uh, oatmeal and some things for the child and came back and uh, fed the child. And I just felt like, God, that child right there will never remember that, you know? And so in a family retreat like this, I, I, I see like, it takes so much energy to raise a kid. <laughs> I don't have kids, you know. So it's, a, it's just incredible, like the amount of uh, sacrifice that our parents, uh, you know, do for us to raise you. And, you know, when you get to uh, past teen and uh, past your adolescent, you don't remember that. Does anybody have a memory when uh, you were little and your parents were feeding you? Yeah? How, what did they feed you? Or how did they feed you? Do you remember? Were you laying down, sitting? No? Why well, you remember that? The bottle, huh? Wow, that's beautiful. What's that? Sucking on the bottle? Wow, you're very lucky. You have a good memory. A lot of us, we don't uh, remember that. And I, I have not figured out why. I've been watching and look, observing the children. Mm, reason, I don't know why we like, don't have these flashes of like, our parents sacrificing. For it. In Vietnamese uh, culture, they have one that's pretty, pretty moving. There's like a poem or a song. I don't know what it is in Vietnamese, but I remember it's like, you know the mat where the baby lays and the ma- mom is sharing the mat with the child and the baby pees, you know, like wets the bed. And you know what the mother would do? We'd take the baby and put her, the baby on the dry part and the mother would lay on the wet part. That's pretty, uh, pretty gross. I mean, you grow up, you're like, oh, man, that's pretty gross. But parents don't think like that. But it's so moving. I was like, really? Do Vietnamese parents do that? Because I don't remember them doing that. But I have a feeling they did do stuff like that. How do they say that in Vietnamese? Chỗ rau? Ah, cho ráo cho con, cho ướt mẹ nằm. Okay, wherever is wet, wherever is dry, I let my child lay. And wherever is wet, the mother will lay there for you. So anyway, it's just, you know, I just think of that image right there, and then it's just like, wow, I uh, really, it's, it, it makes my belly button, my uh, umbilical cord, like kind of like uh, Roy Lena, kind of like it. It, like, it warms it up. Because you, your parents uh, did a lot to nourish you. And this is something I'm trying to figure out. You, you might wonder why we forget that. You know? And some of us remember, like he did, like he uh, remembers sucking on the bottle. So this is something uh, for us in meditation. We can... Can you guys see over there? Can you see the board? Yeah. 
So we have a, uh, we are a fruit, okay? So don't go tell your biology teacher this. But uh, today we learned that we are a fruit. Well, we're, we're very similar to a fruit because our umbilical cord went to our mother, right? And also, so in uh, the way we can look at it is like things that nourish us. That's what we got nourished by, the umbilical cord, right? When we're in the womb of our mother, she doesn't have to make a, a, what is it, feeding bottle or any of that for you. You're automatically getting nutriment, right? And when you're born, what happens? They cut that out, right? But we still, you know, as we are uh, like babies and stuff, you're still getting nourishment from your mom and your dad, right? They're feeding you like the dad I told you. Like they sacrifice and they continue to feed you. And right now, most of you uh, are like getting near teens. Are there teens here too? The teens? Okay, teens here. Okay. Now, the, the teenage year, you're still getting nourishment, but then you're also finding your own nourishment. Right? And so one way we can look at is like, what are things that nourish us? Right? Besides our parents that nourish us to grow into a human being, what are things that nourish us? Can you name one? Friends. Your friends? Wonderful. How about anything else? Teachers. Your teachers? Ah, teachers. How do you do teachers? Okay. Anything else? How about uh, food-wise? What are you nourished by? What makes you grow? Uh, food. food? Like what kind of food? <laughs> tofu. <laughs> All right. Tofu. <laughs> How about what else? A doctor, okay. Doctor helps you when you get sick, right? Anything else? What do you get nourished by? Yeah. Experiences, okay. Experience. Dentist. Wow, you get, yeah, when you get the toothache, you're going to really need them. Okay. You what? Meat? Meat, yes. Uh, meat, what kind of meat? A pig meat or a, a cow meat? Okay. Sorry, that might be an ox, so. <laughs> what else are you uh, nourished by? Water. Water, wonderful. Anything else? Music. Something like that, right? Is that how you do? Okay. So you get mm, a lot of nourishment from many things, right? Anything else? How about where, where does the water come from? Where? where is, from the clouds, right? Where does the cloud come from? From, from more water? All right. Boy. So where are you in here? Okay. 
It comes back from more water. Where does the tofu come from? Hmm? From soybean. Actually, they kind of look like a, a kidney. Where did the soybean come from? Yeah, they come from a, uh, a kind of, it looks like this. And then that comes from the earth, the soil, and then the earth, right? Flower from the sun. Okay, boy, where does the sun come from? From star. Somebody a physicist in here? All right, stardust. Stardust that comes from the cow, right? <laughs> That's incredible. How about where, where does the doctor come from? Ah, from the parent. All right, where do the parents come from? More parents. Wow. And on and on, right? Okay, and what nourishes them? Oh, boy. So all this stuff. How do you do that? Uh, they have their own kind of... Uh... Wow. That's amazing. What was this again? Experiences. Where do your experiences come from? Other people. Other people, really? All right. People. Experiences come from people. And where do people come from? Oh, more people. Boy. Woo. They have their own uh, spiral, huh? What else? What was this? Uh, your parents. Your mom. Similar, huh? Your mom comes from her mom. And her mom comes from her mom. Yeah, and so that kind of creates its own thing. And how about where does music come from? From people. Instruments, that's good. Uh, instrument. And the instruments come from? Trees, maybe. And then people... Yeah, this is a great exercise. Anything I missed up there? I totally forgot what this was. The teacher. The teacher. Oh, that's another one of those. Okay. More and more. Uh, it's another one of these spirals, right? Oh, beautiful. And, of course, the cow. Where does the cow come from? Okay, they come from other cows. Yeah, it's true. And then there's like kind of barn. Yes. And we know the rhythm of the cows, right? Yes, they take care of the farmers, right? Beautiful. So you see these... Uh, you know, with meditation, this is what we look at. We try to find out uh, where our, um, where like where things come from. You you know the Buddha. You, you guys know the story of the Buddha. Yeah, he he uh, he was a young person. In his uh, he was twenty nine years old, and he. Uh, yeah, he sat down, he basically was wondering, like, like, what's the nature of things? You see this exercise? It's not very different from that. When something happens, you just go, oh, where does it come from? 
Like when you get angry, you don't, you don't get, you know, you know, get all riled up. You kind of go, well, where did this anger come from? Where does anger come from? Thoughts. That's right. Anxiety. anxiety, thoughts, you see? And where does anxiety come from? Uh, stress. stress. And where does stress come from? People. Your mind, people, right? You see, you guys are amazing. You have to go around looking like that. Every time something happens, where this has come from. Right? Right now, are you feeling angry? Yeah. That's good. And one day you will. And then you have to ask this question, okay? So meditation, what the Buddha found, was actually a way of looking at this thing, of examining where things and how they arise, right? So you're like, the Buddha was kind of like a scientist. And right now, your mind is the most, uh, how do you call it, uh, clear and unobstructed. Uh, Children's mind, you're very curious and you question everything. And that's very good. You have to like ask, it's like, why, why is this happening? And this is, the, the, this is what mindfulness and meditation is. This is what the monks and nuns have dedicated our lives to. And I'll tell you another story. Recently, during uh, the Buddha's birthday, we had, Visak, we had a big ceremony here. Like, all the people came up. And there were a lot of children because uh, families like to bring their uh, kids up to uh, do the, uh, the ceremony of bathing the baby Buddha. So there were a lot of children. And uh, I sat over there and I watched, uh, a fa- you know, all the kids went and... Uh, we didn't have children's program for that day for some reason. So some parents had to go away with their parents. But one father was in here with his son. He was right over there. And I was sitting over there. I kept looking over. And they were listening to a Dharma talk for one hour and a half. And the boy, probably around your age, a little younger. Um, no, maybe younger than tween. And how do you think the boy felt? He was laying on the mat. He's rolling back, and then every time I look at him, he's rolling the other way. <laughs> and then one time he stood up, and then the father uh, uh, put him back down. And he's like, and then I look over. Uh. And so every time I look over, I was like, oh, man. I really felt when I was uh, young, I had to go to the temple. And I sat in the back, and I was like that. I was like, ah. <laughs> oh, so boring. <laughs> you know, I didn't understand anything, and it's like all adults, and uh, I only went because my parents uh, promised to take us to go to dim sum, <laughs> to eat Chinese breakfast food, and we're like, we sacrifice Sunday morning cartoons to go and eat dim sum. You know, in the morning, 7 o'clock is when all the cool, uh, they had like, I forget the, some of those cartoons, like they're robots. Is it Transformer, maybe? Uh, I forget. No, no, it was, uh, I forget some of these cartoons, but they were like, they only do it on Sunday morning. And I had to sacrifice it and go to the temple and sit in the back. So when I kept looking over at the boy, I was like, okay. I got to, like, compensate for this. And so when the Dhamma talk was over after an hour and, like, 42 minutes or something, and, and they were going to have Dhamma sharing. So the parents and all the adults split into groups, and they have Dhamma sharing. And I was like, oh, my God. It's going to kill the kid. <laughs> so I came over to the dad, and I said, all right, we're not going to Dhamma sharing. We're going for a hike. And so the boy... Uh, and I thought he would love it. I was like, you, you want to go on a hike? And he's like, no, I don't like hiking. I was like, you want to go sit with your dad and listen to more adults? He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, come on, I can show you something. And it's really dangerous. And he's like, really? Okay. <laughs> 
So by the time we were at the dining hall going up like this, all these other kids came. And uh, we had a, a parent with two, two daughters, and then we had a, a, another uh, mother with like two... It was a bunch of kids and a few parents that uh, knew uh, that they, we were going to go hiking for the kids. So we go on this hike, and uh, right before, the boy was resisting. He's like, no, I don't like hiking. And I was like, just try it, okay? We'll see how it goes, right? And so we take the kids, go hiking, and the parents are a little nervous because I told them, like, the, you know, the kids, they, they like dangerous stuff, you know, like, don't tell your parents, okay? <laughs> this is outside a children's program. <laughs> so don't tell them <laughs> we're going to go hiking, and it's a little bit dangerous. <laughs> it's up the waterfall. And it is kind of borderline dangerous, but it's, uh, you know, you'll get scratched and stuff. But there's an area where it's really risky. And I like to take the, especially some of the brave ones. Once they cross that, they become another person. Um, they feel like they, they, they accomplish something. So, uh, but we're going to fix it up, make it a little bit more safe. Mm. <laughs> but uh, while we're hiking up, you know, we, uh, we stop and then we look down and we rested at this bench. There was a bench there and we rested on this bench. And we sat there and uh, we tried our best to be quiet. And then when we went further up the hike and we looked back at the bench. I said, look, there's the bench that uh, we sat on. And you know what the boy said? He's like, I don't see the bench. I was like, it's right there. I was like, I don't see the bench. And I was like, whoa, I know your personality. And I was like, I can relate to that. You, 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 you ever, can you relate to that? Yeah? Everyone saw it, and then this boy, who is my first time meeting him, but well, that was my first uh, window into what kind of uh, character he is. He's like, no, I don't see it. I was like, it's right there, and everyone sees it. He's like, I don't see it. I was like, are you kidding me? Look, everyone here sees it. And he's like, no, I don't see it. <laughs> I said, like, okay, all right, we go, let's go. We continue the hike up the mountain. And then uh, we cross to the area where it's kind of dangerous. It's like, okay, everyone, you have to be careful here because I don't have insurance. <laughs> and uh, so we cross, slowly cross. And then the boy, he, uh, um, he's, uh, he's like, wow, because we're on this rock over the waterfall and it's like dangerous. You don't want to drop. And it's really uh, like dangerous. And he... he he liked it, but I didn't want to, like, uh, uh, you know, put him on the spot. He's like, wow. He's like, he's like that. And I go, now you like the hike, huh? I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it, you know? I was like, no. I was like, come on. Your feeling, you know, over there when you started, you didn't like it, but now your feeling can change. It's okay. And he's like, no. Um, I forget exactly the conversation I had, but it was like, no, I don't, mm, I don't like it. And I was like, it's okay that your feelings change, you know. And he's like, no. Uh, uh, I was like, things change. It's okay for things to change. And then he said, nothing. It was a, if I remember correctly, he said, nothing changes. Because I remember reacting to him, and I said, really, nothing changes. Because he's really smart, smart, uh, smart, very young. But I don't know what kind of upbringing or ancestry he's at. But he's already, like, arguing with me. And he said, no, nothing changes. So I gave him the homework. I was like, you go home, and you come back and find me one thing that does not change. Right? He said, okay. You know, and that was his homework. So I'm waiting for him to uh, come back to the monastery to find one thing that doesn't change. And that's one, uh, that's one thing I want to share with you, right? And give you for your homework. Find one thing that does not change. That will be your homework. 
And you know, after that, as we sat there, guess what he said? He said, now I see the bench is over there. <laughs> you see that? And so, it is a gift I give to you because we can identify with this young, uh, young boy very much. I saw myself in him. I was exactly like that. No. I don't agree. No. I was very rebellious. How many of you are rebellious? Come on, be, including the parents. Yeah? Yeah, I was uh, very rebellious and very uh, stubborn as well. And it's good. It's okay. We could question things, challenge things, but we need to recognize that. You know, that kind of, also very proud. How many of you are very proud? Come on. Seriously? Oh, maybe you don't recognize it yet. But it's this one. <laughs> Come on, we all have that. <laughs> you know, it's like, I know better than you. Um, so this is a little bit uh, the, 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 uh, the rebellion, the, you know, the, the, we're all going through that as young people, as we're growing, we're meant to challenge our parents. They don't like to hear that, but it's our way to uh, find our boundaries, to, uh, to discover uh, the world and how things work. And that is actually testing edges and envelopes. And so mindfulness, the meditation, he helps us recognize that when it causes uh, others more suffering. It comes sometimes we're very, you know, very resistant, right? When change, things change and we don't want it to change. Like our feelings, it changes, but then we are like, we resist it. It's like, no, I'm still angry, right? And so recognize that our feelings are always changing. Our uh, thoughts are, uh, you know, when you're a baby, you're different. As you grow older, you have different condition and it makes you more different, right? So as a meditator, as someone who sits and reflect, so that's what meditation, that's what this place is for, for people to take a break from the busyness, from your parents to take business, to come here, slow down, and to ask these questions, where do these sadness feelings and things come from? Where do my food come from? How does an orange come to be on my plate? You see? You see the, the, the wonder. And don't lose that, okay? Because you'll lose that as you grow older and you uh, become like, kind of like more adult-ish and you kind of like know how things work. And you don't question anymore. And this is a, a, a sadness of it. When you don't begin to question why you do something. Or what is true happiness. So for, for us, we just share with you the method of, of uh, what the Buddha found. It's called a method. It's kind of like a training, they call it. To train our mind so we can look like this. And I see many of you are very uh, uh, open to that. So please continue to uh, uh, be inquisitive, to wonder, and to question and ask. And if you, you can ask your parents, or you can come here and ask the monks and nuns, because this is our life. Mm, our life is monks and nuns. Our, we're dedication. We don't make money. We don't, uh, you know, we can't get fired. We don't have a job. We don't have a boss. And our, uh, our only, uh, we don't raise kids, so we're very happy that you come here. <laughs> and so our task is only is to uh, uh, find ways to be in the world, right? To be uh, 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 happier in the world and to cause less suffering. So I just wanted to share with you and continue to question like we did all the fruits, right? And ask, where does this fruit come from? And when you uh, want to come in touch with your mom, you take your finger, 
you put it in your there and you put it in your belly, okay? And you can remember, wow. Well, you can remember that you forgot. Where, those memories are not gone. They're still there. That you're connected to your parents and all those conditions that are nourishing you to become, you know, fully uh, a ripening fruit. Okay, so I want to transmit to you that is the basic uh, Buddhist uh, uh, training, but uh, shared in a very simple way for you to understand. But uh, our lives as monks and nuns is to ask, like, where do these things come from? Especially our feelings, our, how we look at things, our views. And our ideas, where do our ideas come from, right? You know what those are, right? Ideas about yourself, what the, the world, and especially look at people you idolize, why you idolize them. Who are the people you idolize, and what is it? What is it that you idolize? So continue to question that. And that's how you, uh, what we call uh, traveling on the path. You see, you're exploring your world and be uh, surprised, okay? Don't be too sure about uh, finding, you know, the only answer because there's many, many uh, people who have found a very similar answer but a little different. So be open to that and uh, and this is something I want to share with you and Please, if you find anything new, especially if you find something that doesn't change, please come and tell me, okay? Uh, I will buy you the plane ticket, all right? <laughs> you come here and you discover it and you would have solved the whole riddle of this whole, uh, this whole thing. The Buddha tried to do that and what he discovered is like, it's very difficult to, to find that. So thank you for staying in here and listening. And you can uh, continue outside, I believe. So so the tweens, you can um, thank you for uh, being here and listening to us. And we uh, hear the one sound of the bell. You can uh, stand up and bow. Okay, please stand up. Join your palms. And... uh, can bow to our teachers and we can turn around and bow to all of our parents. Thank you for being such a good listener. Enjoy uh, the rest of your morning. For those who are sitting anywhere in the back, you can come up if you want, or on the side if you need a cushion, please, uh, you can come up. How many of us are here without uh, children? Okay. Are are you enjoying being here with all the children? I mean, I guess you're not going to say no, right? (laughs) It's kind of (laughs) hard. It looks like our family retreat is uh, 
gravitating to be more and more like it's all about family and the, the ones with children. But I know we also need people who are, don't have children to be here. But it seems uh, uh, we're slowly evolving to a retreat where we have to center it around, like beginning anew, you know, to have uh, that be central to our, it seems like that's very uh, uh, beneficial, but uh, somehow it's kind of like squeezed in a little bit. So that's something uh, we'll look at. Mm. And the Dharma sharing is also very nice for us to mm, touch base as adults, as parents. So we see the benefit of both. Mm. Maybe we'll listen to one sound of the bell and close our eyes and just feel uh, how grateful we are still in the retreat. Our family is still here. The teens are out, right? The teens also left. So we're mostly kind of like big children here. Mm. I, uh, for the family retreat, I, I do prepare myself. And for the teen camp as well. For any of the retreats, mm. I prepare myself before the retreat. Maybe a month ahead of time. And I begin to uh, read up on what are the new challenges for children, for families. Mm. So you prepare your mind to uh, get into the common uh, challenge of raising a family mm. in our modern society. Mm. And it seems like the, it's getting tougher to because to, uh, there's so many uh, uh, access to information and our children are exposed so much to uh, all kinds of ways, <laughs> which is great, you know, but it's, uh, it's challenging for us because we as parents also uh, need to set boundaries and also, uh, yeah, uh, as parents must do you know, to, to guide their, their children. And I think uh, a parent came to me and, you know, was concerned a little bit about their teenager or, or their child becoming a teenager and whether they should go to the teen camp. And I really felt the love of the parents, you know, to really provide a nurturing environment for the teens. And it's kind of scary, too, because, you know, the, the older teens will be there and they probably have a lot more suffering. <laughs> And uh, you're wondering if your 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 beginning, uh, uh, you know, nascent uh, teen should be, you know, exposed to the older teens <laughs> and what they're going to. So I totally understand, and I felt the 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 challenge of parenting to 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 navigate and to know what is best for your child. And so I I feel for you uh, as parents. Um, and we are here in the monastery, we're trying our best to be supportive. And I wish all families could experience this, you know, what we're experiencing. Um, for you to come here and have a break from your parents. Mm. I had to tell one parent to, uh, don't worry, they're not going to do anything that bad at a monastery. <laughs> you know, he was like, where's my child? I was like, take a break. You know, practice with like not knowing where your child is. I know that's scary, but actually, that's a, a kind of anxiety, you know. Like, you always have to know where your child is. I know outside you need to do that, but it's so nice to come to an environment where you can let that go. Mm. I know, like, some churches and stuff, you, you know, like, they, they abuse and so on, and, and it's kind of scary being around, like, you know, religious institution because the media is so, like, you know... Uh, Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's certain 
you know, scariness to it. You know, where they go, who they with, and you know. But I can feel that 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 kind of like what is best for our child, right? And that's very biological as well, mm. as well as uh, childhood and how we were raised. Mm. And I think that's something when I uh, I'm addressing parents when we had the family defeat and it was smaller, we had a, a parent program. And so all the parents would come in there and some would sneak in even if they're not, they don't have any children. And I used to teach uh, non-parenting. So I, I, uh, I really emphasized for the parents to come here and like totally let go of their parenting. And that means that they can't do this and they can't tell their child what to do. Oh my God, there's like, I have a, a list of things that they, non-parenting. And it's very hard for us because biologically it's so, you know, but it's actually, it, you know, mm, that's the part that actually caused so much suffering to our child. Mm, it's kind of like, a, it's a little bit domineering. Um, so there's a point somewhere in between there where you have to play around with that. And uh, the teen camp, we, uh, the teen camps, they come here and the parents are not uh, allowed to come. In the early beginning years of the teen camp, some parents said, can I volunteer to be staff? <laughs> I was like, come on, let go, okay? Your f- child will be okay. <laughs> I was like, can I be in the kitchen? I really cook really well. I was like, no, no, you cannot come, okay? Because we promised the teens, you know? And so we really feel them, that they want to be away from their parents and to find their way. And this is very, uh, very healthy for them. And that's a little bit uh, hard for parents to have that trust that it will be okay. Because we all want the best. Mm. Recently, uh, uh, I interacted with the parent, and uh, you can feel the, they don't want their child to uh, experience any suffering. It was like, no, you know, you got to, like, be watch out. Don't get into relationship. You know? <laughs> but in the end, we, after listening to the parent, I realized that the, actually she's afraid of suffering. She's afraid of her child suffering. And that's, and she's, and they're really, uh, really hardcore Buddhists too, like totally, like has the sutra memorized and everything. But as a parent, you can totally understand that they don't want their child to suffer. But actually, that goes against what the Buddha had discovered, that there is suffering and you cannot avoid it. So that's the un, uh, you know, uncomfortable truth. Uh, an inconvenient truth, right? In, is that? There's an inconvenient truth about climate. There's an inconvenient truth about being human. <laughs> there is. <laughs> you know, there is suffering and you cannot avoid it. Try. <laughs> and there's uh, suffering waiting for your child. And you have to visualize it. They are going to suffer. They're going to have a partner. They're not going to be accepted by their peers. And they're going to suffer. And you have to really come into terms with that. Let alone your own suffering. And we all know, we've, we've all been uh, actually through that, uh, those years, right? As teenagers, as child. And, um, and so on. So they have their own uh, levels of suffering. And we don't diminish it, actually. It's quite, uh, it's quite important for them as well. It's quite intense. And so, yeah, this is something... Um, yeah, I really appreciate the, uh, the family retreat because it allows me to reflect on my own upbringing, my own parents my family, my siblings, and about society, about education, about, you know, rearing, rearing, is that right? Rearing, is that a word? Rear, to rear, or is that only for animals? 
It's for children? Okay. Rearing. So for me, uh, in this uh, reflection of my own kind of upbringing and my, my own family, and I've come to discover uh, maybe I just flip it. Does this thing flip? It does, right? Ah, great. Mm. I learned to discover uh, that uh, and to admit that I have uh, some wounds. That's one thing uh, to accept and to acknowledge and to uh, celebrate too. You know, I, my family came from the war and I was a refugee. I was six, seven when we escaped. And it's funny, but one of my painful moments is getting, giving away my, my little uh, three-wheel bike. I had like one of those low plastic in Vietnam, you know, it's like, <laughs> has a big wheel in the front, it has two wheels in the back. I can still remember it. It has these flary things on the side. Yeah, exactly. And you, you pedal the front. I had to give it away. And not know why. Because my parents didn't tell us that we were leaving the country for good. Right? And I remember feeling like, <laughs> you know, later on, feeling that kind of like, no one told me we're leaving our house, our country, forever. <laughs> you know, that's a kind of childhood pain, right? So we have wounds. Uh, I think there's many names for it now. I think one of the big ones is uh, trauma, right? Or uh, uh, yeah, there's many terms. But, you know, Buddhist, the Buddha just calls it suffering. So wound, right? To uh, actually, part of uh, meditation is to, to recognize suffering. So actually, it's not like a bad thing. It's actually to discover, and some of us don't want to admit it or don't want to look at it, and we're, oh, we're fine, we're, I'm good, I had a great childhood, or, or whatever. And I, I know many families that seem like they're like ideal, and then you talk to their teenager, and you're like, well, it's pretty intense, actually. The house is very orderly. <laughs> you know, there are different forms of, uh, of uh, uh, and so in this contemplation is to actually, when we acknowledge this, it's, uh, it's very healing. It's like knowing where the cuts are so that, you know, you don't touch it, you don't pry at it, and you don't allow, uh, you know, you don't allow uh, festering environments. So for me, that was the uh, first discovery in, in my own words, in my own reflection in my past, uh, the way, you know, I was like, great. I remember images of me as a child being handed from one adult to the next as we escaped from boat, small boat to medium, medium boat to a bigger boat, and then being rescued out at sea by a bigger boat. <laughs> and I remember, like, you know, no one telling us what's going on, right? So as a child, and this is happening right now, you know, in the Mediterranean, still happening in Asia, in places that are, um, you know, at the edge of uh, climate and mm, injustice and exploitation. You know, people are having to do that right now, mothers and children. So I feel that connection, uh, that pain that is still happening as a child. And this helps me, it fortifies my, uh, why I want, what I want to do with my life. This is ve my childhood uh, pain is very related to how and how I behave around children. So the, in reflection, our own uh, wounds, our own suffering, it gives us a direction. 
That's the way, uh, what's cool about Buddhism. It, it just doesn't stay with our story, our narrative, our wounds, but it uses it to give us uh, a direction, to relieve, to cause less suffering, to relieve our wounds, and to help others relieve their wounds. And so that's a, a first kind of like mm, acknowledgement, and it was the kind of like the first kind of like you know, like standing on my own two feet, kind of, to, uh, to acknowledge that. And the second one I have learned to identify is our, our habits. So we have wounds in our psyche and so on, in our uh, uh, upbringing, our behavior. And then we have habits, and they're very related. Usually the wounds will create us to have habits. So we have tendencies. We want to be first, or we undermine ourselves, or we self-deprecate, is that? Self-harm, right? Very self-critical. So these are habits, both in behavior as well as uh, mental habits. Patterns, there's another word, uh, another word for it, is patterns, right? And as parents, you got to do this homework. If you, your child, you know, you're raising a, a child, it's so important to remember this because uh, then, then you, you can liberate the, uh, the transmission. You see that? That is, now you're a practitioner. You're not just a parent. You are a warrior, a meditator, a uh, contemplative uh, person. So, there you go. so see yourself not as just rearing parents and making a family and having, you know, your genes continue, but now you are actually a practitioner. And that's about liberation. That is the path that the Buddha discovered. How to liberate ourselves from our habits and to heal our wounds and not to continue the wound. Isn't that amazing? So liberation is not like, oh, you know, you become the Buddha or like you have freedom from some system. But liberation is to heal these wounds, no more bleeding. And you don't make other wounds in your children and others. And the same thing with habits. You rehabit, you re, uh, rehabilitate or rehabitate, rehabitate, is that a word? Rehabitate? Rehabitate. Sorry, my English is not so... Uh... <laughs> Notions, third one. I have a lot of ideas, thanks to my education. And they, uh, they, they, uh, they cause you a lot of suffering. And so you got to know what kind of notions you have about happiness, what success is. I mean, I don't want to go through the list, but I just share with you, like, these three things has helped me, like, know what I'm supposed to be doing in this world. Yeah? Is, uh, is the reason why I'm, like, why I'm a monk and why I'm, like, so inspired to like, you know, talk to like troubled children and kids because I totally relate to them. And this, our notion, and what is normal? How about that one? What is normal? Children, teenagers, teen camp, they asked that. We had a, a whole session here. This board was filled with words. I don't forget that session we had, but it was amazing how inquisitive and like tolerant and expansive teenagers are if we allow them to explore notions of what is normal, what is right, what is, uh, and they're supposed to do that. And as parents, we hate that. Man, don't question me. 
question mommy. <laughs> and we need to, uh, if you don't have this down, that's where you become very, uh, 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 I don't want to say, it's not dogmatic, but very uh, rigid. Rigid. And that's how you continue suffering. Because when you're rigid and someone is coming to question your notion, and of course, this, uh, I'm not teaching about parenting here, right? This is about a practitioner. And you can do whatever you want with it when you uh, merge it with parenting. So it's a disclaimer. We do need to set boundaries and we need to let our kids know, no. And so this is, uh, but if you have these things out, the way you set boundaries, the way you guide, is it will be a lot more freer. You're not doing out of your habit or your role as a parent. The hats, right? So you, you get to choose. So as a practitioner, as a parent, um, as a child, you're still a child. Every one of us is, still has an inner child. I saw a father sit there during beginning a new cry, like totally bawling out. And it was so easy for anyone to see the little boy in that father. You know, I was like, wow. This is like the most amazing. And the boy looks over at the father, probably his first time crying in front of the mother. Isn't that beautiful? That is the, uh, you know, the, you know, what we touch here. And this is a, a very, uh, str- I don't know what you call it, but uh, it's very therapeutic. And Buddhist uh, meditation is very therapeutic. It's not intellectual. So it's like, be careful when you start thinking you understand something. Because then it, it becomes a notion. But if it starts to make you cry like you don't know why, that's more Buddhist. You know what I mean? It's like it's a, a, it's a, it's a cellular. It's, a, it's like it makes you tingle. It makes you like lose control. <laughs> because you know what, what, what all that wound is, is actually we're supposed to have cried back then. Oh, we're supposed to have like have compulsion like I should have when I was being shipped across the planet. I should have like feared and like shaken, but I didn't. So my body holds it. So I grew up a very young, a young man, very mm, tight. And I was quite uh, like chip on my shoulder, even though I looked nice, but I was a volcano. And you should see me when I get into fights. I'm like a wild animal. <laughs> you know, we were discriminated and we had to, you know, set our boundaries. And I was like, wow, I was so small back then. How could I be, you know, be so... Uh... But, you know, that's the pain of all that held uh, tension. So when we now, as adults, uh, when we cry or when we have convulsion, let it happen. And I think uh, someone is really exploring it is uh, what's Levine. Then yeah, uh, Stephen Levine, no? yeah, he's uh, really exploring that, and he he sh- he got it right on the dot. And the Buddha already kind of ex- shared that about the being in the body and embodiment and allowing your body to relax and like have those convulsion because the energy moves out, these hidden uh, uh, energies that are uh, what we call like uh, the, the like kind of more implicit stuff underneath that we don't see. And if you practice more and more to recognize that and to transform that, then you can see it in others. You can see it in your boss, you can see it in successful people. It's very obvious. But don't go tell them that. Oh, you're suffering. You just don't know it. And they'll probably fire you. <laughs> yeah? 
So you begin to see the eye. It's like, man, there's ways that people hide their, uh, 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 from their suffering, and they create these patterns that protect them from having to deal with it. And what will happen? They will get to a point. Yeah, and that's the beginning of Buddhism. They will hit their wall, their suffering, and they will come to a retreat. So that's the pattern. <laughs> so wounds, we... Uh, and the way I, I uh, uh, for myself, this is a, a kind of re, this is to help me remember, like what we're, what we're training. I remember the first time as a monk, uh, I get to go home visit. And I remember meeting Thai, and I was his attendant, and his, uh, um, and he and I asked him for Thai, do you have any advice for uh, my first home visit? Because he know I had a uh, difficulty with my dad, um, and he gave me a book, uh, Old Path White Cloud, in Chinese, first time translated, to give to my father. But then he said, I'll never forget. He said, when you go home visit, practice restraint. And I'm like, restraint? Really? And uh, I didn't know what he meant until I went back to L.A. And, you know, I was with my f- friends. And, you know, it's like all your habits come back up. <laughs> you go to, like, they take you to this uh, restaurant. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, you know, that's my first uh, visit home. And then uh, two years later, I was like, okay, I understand. And so by then, I was like, I don't go driving. If my friends want to visit me, they come to the house. Uh, so I don't use my mom's car or my dad's car. And so I started restraining myself, meaning putting uh, guidelines, guards, to protect myself so that uh, these habits don't get triggered. You understand? And we need this. Once you identify your habits, you need to put some fences. And I know this goes against those of us who love freedom. Who, uh, who are the ones fighting for freedom? Yeah? Freedom. Everything is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom to do whatever you want, anytime you want. I was like that. And I caused a lot more wounds. So I see with restraint actually is a kind of freedom prevents you from doing something that will be harmful for yourself. You set it up so that you don't harm yourself. Like I don't drink, so I am free from a deluded mind. You know? You see that? So I don't drink. It's not like I am not free to drink, but like I don't drink because I know what it does to my mind. So I am free from that kind of mind. So freedom in Buddhism is very different from the freedom outside where you can do everything you want. And there's a consequence to that. So the five mindfulness training is very related to this. So when you begin to see your pattern of parenting or partnership or whatever, the way you behave, the way you react, and look for patterns, okay? Patterns. And this is very related to parenting or, uh, or I think beyond parenting. It's just, but it's very uh, heightened with uh, uh, parent-child relationship patterns, edges. You know, you can see I was trained as an architect. I love, uh, <laughs> look for this, this, and then when they meet, there's a, uh, so it's a way of looking at uh, when we have habits, not, habits are not uh, uh, harmful. There are habits that are good. Brushing your teeth is a good habit. Waking up early, sitting is a good habit. Laying and relaxing your body every day is a good habit. Laying on the hammock, not reading a book, is a good habit. So in a way, a habit is also, there are good habits and bad habits. 
And the ones that we identify that cause suffering, we need to create uh, guidelines, fences. That's where the five mindfulness trainings come from. That's where our fine manners, our, the monks, we have whatever, 200 and something. And uh, we use that to, to and every two weeks, we come and we read, we read those and remind ourselves. And then before that day, we actually should have been reflecting on it. And then if there's something that you, you know, was not, you were not so helpful, you, you go and share with the brother. So that's ingrained into our culture in the monastery. And this is something you, you can apply to your home life, in your family, to, in raising child, uh, your child. And I think we do this as parents to create boundaries, right? Uh, internet, I know some parents, mm, very strict with internet. And I've seen the good result of that. Their children can have a conversation with me longer than the ones who have full access, what do you call it? Yeah, of internet. There's some parents are very strict. Two hours after school, that's it. And, the, you know, the children, I'm sure, revolt and so on, but uh, they're very strict. And so there's a little sh- restraint there. Uh, wounds here is also is very similar. Here is, uh, mm, you know, uh, the new word is not to trigger. So not to pick it. So that's what uh, uh, beginning a new, those process that you're going through mm, is helping with. And beginning a new, there's a fourth uh, step. There's flower watering, expressing a regret, expressing a hurt, and then asking for support. Okay? So everyone in the family, we know each other's wounds, and we agree to we refrain from pushing those buttons and scratching those wounds. So actually, in your family, you write all those down. You know, Daddy, okay, I have these buttons. Please don't, please refrain from pushing them. Mommy, one, two, three. Johnny, Bill. And you type it all up, and then everyone signs, and you put it right somewhere in the house. It's so cool, huh? I wish parents, uh, a family, I mean, that's ideally how it should work, but you find ways to, to uh, get that conversation with your, your children. I saw that some of that possibility with uh, when we did Beginning Anew. Some of the children were quite actually uh, very uh, sincere and, yeah, they really spoke. So that's the refraining from touching each other's uh, wounds the buttons, right? If you don't want daddy to behave like this and cause suffering, please don't touch that button. So these are are ways for us to not only find our own path, but for a family to begin to, uh, yeah, to create an environment where it's more uh, conducive to like uh, healthy growth. Uh, Not that there will be no more suffering, but when they're suffering, we know what to do with it. And of course, notions, that one uh, is a little bit more, you know, as you continue to study uh, and learn more about Buddhism, this is, uh, this is kind of like, uh, I would, I, I've called uh, questioning. So review. So you kind of re-examine everything. You, uh, you, you begin to question and like, like your uh, safety, you know, for instance, safety and security. So you begin to look at that. Like security is huge, right? You want financial security, what else? Uh, hmm? Physical security, emotional security, safety. How many of you have cameras around your house? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's a... Uh, you feel more secure? Hmm? 
My mom, you know, I came home and uh, my brother set that up. We have three around my mom's house. And she has an app. And that app, every day, tells you in the neighborhood what has been broken into, where, what crime was committed, small or large. Every day you get some news about some break-in. Think about that. Does that make you more secure? I was like, now I know in the neighborhood, wow, there's a break-in every day. <laughs> so uh, I turned that all off. I uh, dismantled the, uh, the app. And so that's Notion. Uh, financial security, your job, your insurance. Yeah, this is a little bit more advanced because it's going to challenge a lot of your notions about what is uh, safe, what is secure, what is happiness. And uh, recently I've been exploring some. I just uh, finished here. And uh, I think it's uh, my own exploration. And so, disclaimer, use at your own risk. Yeah? Um, hygiene. Cleanliness. You know, children here, you know, they're so afraid of getting dirty. You know, I take, you know, I take them on a hike, and it's like, geez, come on, it's just dirt. <laughs> or their parents, you know. You know, it's like, uh, I saw a, a parent uh, a few weeks ago, their baby was eating, and well, the baby had like a whole full-on, like, uh, you know, not just a bib, but a, a whole costume to eat. And I love watching that baby eat because the parents would put the spaghetti on the thing and the baby was like, like an artist, like uh, Rothko, you know. And you watch the baby, you know, because part of their eating is not just to eat. It's to play, to create, to explore, to like see if the parents react. <laughs> I was watching it. It was so amazing. And the parent did not wipe the baby once. Wow, I was like, this is a special kind of family. <laughs> but you know, the baby was loving it. Oh my God, I was watching it. Anyway, that's a disclaimer. That's not how you should raise your kid. But I love seeing alternative ways of what they consider like uh, normal, right? So hygiene. Uh, that's very, and I think both, uh, all of you know about like mm, children being too hygienic when they're growing up, so they have a, a lot of allergies now. Really proven and studied, so this is not, so germs and stuff. You know, there's a baby here that's like chewing on um, like wooden pieces, and the parents are like, yeah. And I'm like, whoa, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> Maybe in Africa. Uh, but like, you know, so, we, you know, you have to know the culture that we live in and what we consider. Like, if they're like chewing on a piece of plastic, you're like, yeah, it's fine. It's probably clean. But on a piece of bark, you're like, ugh. But you got to question that. The plastic is cleaner than a piece of bark. That notion is scary. So that's why it's advanced practice. I'll go through real quick. Mm. Hygiene, uh, safety, I already uh, shared that. Uh, you know, and that's biological too, to protect your child. And uh, I've seen, I love watching parents and how they react to when their child falls. If you, uh, if you come here and you stay long enough, you begin to see so many ways the parent react when a child falls. And you can see the whole history of that family. <laughs> <laughs> Some parents, when their child falls, oh my God, their parent is more berserk than the child. Yeah? And the child gets all of that. You know, and then you see some parents are very, oh, what happened, honey? Wow, you fell. Well, let's see. Oh, you know. Of course, they need nurturing, but there's a way of approaching it. It's so beautiful to see the child come up. And then, I saw a child actually in this retreat, very small, fell, 
got up and ran to the mother as if it was normal. It was like, that was amazing to see that. I have a lot of hope for the future. <laughs> a little child, totally cool with falling. You can see the, uh, the beginning of, uh, of how we deal with suffering. You see that? When you fall and then your energy is like, oh, that shouldn't have happened. That energy, you can transmit that. If a child doesn't fall, actually it's very abnormal. That is a notion. If a teenager does not argue with you, you better be worried. I know you don't like to hear that, but uh, <laughs> that's why it's advanced practice. <laughs> anyway, I will um, just share maybe one more. I have a whole list of uh, what I call uh, de-domesticating your family. And one of them is uh, control. You want everything to work out the way you plan it. And so parents, I would love to do a meditation, guided meditation, where I take a cup and it's sitting here with orange juice and I drop it <laughs> and the orange juice spills on the table and you have to sit and breathe. <laughs> Just imagine that. The orange juice is spilling and it's dripping over the table. And you have to breathe and feel your tension in your body. The orange juice is spilling. That shouldn't have happened. Who did this? So guided meditation, there's another level. And we're working on that. We're going to come up with some that will make your spine go, ooh. <laughs> That's just the beginning, huh? A cup of milk. Can you imagine that? How about give me your gadget? Uh, there's more coming. But we, just to be humorous about it, to recognize that how we react to things is based on our womb, how we have been habituated, how we've been nurtured, and some of it is natured. And this is what's wonderful about this practice. That all is good. And we're just discovering them. So there's nothing bad about any of it. And that's the beauty that our teacher has uh, transmitted to us. That we, ex we welcome the challenge and the suffering. Because now we have a practice. And then lastly, uh, we have a community. So please continue to find like-minded friends who are on the path. And continue to help build uh, communities of resistance, community of resistance. That is the lineage that we are in. Our teacher came here into America, into Europe, to create communities of resistors. Okay? This is the power that we uh, can empower ourselves with, to resist our own habits, resist uh, being tempted, and then we can help uh, the others do the same. So please build a community where you're at and find like-minded friends. And if you don't, come to Deer Park and be here and help us. And Deer Park, we, we, our vision is to, to create a multifold community, to have lay friends live here, you know, actually like the neighborhoods. So if you're planning to move a house, Please move near here. We need more, uh, you know, friends of practice and families and children. So that's the vision of our teacher. I call it a village. I didn't call it a monastery. Plum village. So his original vision is to create villages. To support each other and to raise children as a village. It's not sustainable to do it with just a mom and a dad. It's very hard, yeah? And you can continue to uh, create more wounds. So your child is actually meant to be shared. 
believe it or not. <laughs> but like children here, you know, outside, we, uh, we're having to, because of condition, we have to teach them differently. To don't talk to strangers. Or don't look over there, and so on. Then when they come here, I challenge that. I touch them. And they're like, you know, I was like, it's okay. You know, and slowly, by the third day, they're giving me a hug. So we need to uh, counterculture this kind of like, I know outside is probably the thing to do because it's strangers and so on. But it's very uh, detrimental to the human, the humanity of your child. So this is uh, our vision, our teacher's vision, to create a, a more sane, healthy, and compassionate society. That is the, the North Arrow. So please uh, help us and uh, keep bringing your children here. I want to see your children grow every year here, okay? And uh, good luck with registration. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to try to solve that somehow but uh, you know that's part of uh, actually why we're uh, you know expanding and creating more rooms and potentially more uh, dormitories for parents and more uh, well, we need more monastics to to, to uh, help uh, hold this space so thank you dear family and we can uh, yeah we can end here with three sounds to bring a sense of gratitude to all the people here.